Well, after having written a number of books about Newcastle in the 1800s, I certainly became fascinated by the AA Company. Um, talk about being in the right place at the right time. As I go through, you'll sort of find out how they became established and why they prospered. And um, 1824 was when they were um, formulated in England. And of course, next year is their 200th anniversary. So I just hope there's someone out there who's been going through their archives for the last few years and writing a book because obviously it should be celebrated. And um, with 200 years of history, I think they're probably the oldest company in Australia. I think they have to be close to it. So they're very, very important in our history. All right, so once again, I acknowledge the Awabakal and Warramai people, the traditional owners of the land. And they have lived in the Newcastle and Port Stephens area for thousands of years. And that is obviously compared to European occupation, which is about 200 years. So the Australian Agricultural Company was instituted in London, as I said, in 1824, and was a joint venture funded by British and colonial interests. Now, the person behind the establishment of the AA Company was John MacArthur. He, um, was the son of John and Elizabeth MacArthur, and of course they were into um, sheep, um, growing of wool. Other investors included eight members of the MacArthur family, 27 members of the House of Commons, and a number of the directors were also directors of the Bank of England. So you've got very established people who know what the go is, and um, they received a grant of one million acres of land in New South Wales. Their aim was to improve the fleece of the merino sheep and also to grow um, crops for export, including tobacco, flax, olives and others. So Robert Dawson was appointed a chief agent in 1825 and he came out here with a number of employees, their families, 800 merino sheep, eight cattle and six horses. He searched for suitable land. Now, you've got an English person coming out to Australia searching for suitable land, and he decided on an area of um, 500,000 acres, basically between Port Stephens and the Manning River. The first settlement was at a place called Carrington on the southern shore of Port Stephens, so you've got to forget about Carrington, Newcastle. And within 12 months, they had 1,000 head of cattle and 2,000 sheep. You often get the thing that people come out from England and they farm the way they did in England. You know, they've come out and they've decided that this coastal area would be suitable for sheep. Well, it wasn't. So basically they're on a steep learning curve. So they tried other crops, wheat, maize, barley and silk, and still without success. And also thrown into the mix by 1829, Sheep throughout the colony were affected by disease and their condition worsened due to a severe drought. Um, basically, John MacArthur's influence over the AA company waned. Now, they were successfully raising sheep in Sydney at Camden, um, but in general, the area wasn't suited for sheep. So as part of their history, you find them moving inland. Today we know the sheep um, growing areas and wheat are also sort of northwestern New South Wales. So they're going to move away from the coast and they set up, um, the residence was Tarley House and it was situated in the mouth of the Karuga River. And it was home to the next four superintendents and it was sort of substantial in that it was home to 300 people but it was closed by the company in 1856. Now, built in 1826, this is a painting of it. This was not the original Tarley House. This was the one that was rebuilt. And basically, mouth of the Karua River. And you can see this is a depiction by someone who lived there in 1885. And this is Tarley House today. Has anyone been there to visit it? No? All right, still stands um, today. This was um, some photos that were taken by someone who went and visited it last year. 
and these are other buildings on the property. So these were the AA Company office buildings. And in 1943, the property was leased and then purchased by the Gospel Fisherman Mission. And it operated as a missionary training camp and Bible college. And in 2018, the premises were taken over by Youth with a Mission Movement. So it is still open today. It is being used and um, still stands, obviously. This is another building in Carrington. This is a convict-built church that was built in 1847 and it closed 1862. And if um, you may have seen, it was actually offered for sale a few months ago. It was in the, um, I saw it in the Newcastle Herald and I was quite excited, you know, a church at Carrington. Of course, when I saw it, I realised it wasn't Carrington, New South Wales, uh, Carrington, Newcastle but um, the Carrington up near the Karua River. All right. So basically they're starting to get the idea that this coastal settlement was not particularly successful as regards sheep and wheat, so they're starting to move inland. And when Captain Parry took over control of the company in 1830, um, he went to explore the area and started to move its operations to Stroud. So it started out at Carrington and then it's gone inland to Stroud. And what had been known as Number Two Farm was named Stroud. Now they had 500,000 acres of land at Port Stephens. So Perry negotiated an exchange of part of the Port Stephens estate for land on the Liverpool Plains and near the Peel River. All right. So as I say, they're moving inland to land that's more suitable for the wool and wheat that they wish to grow. And the company's headquarters were moved to Sydney in 1856. So basically you've got Carrington and Stroud being the headquarters for the AA company, but only for a certain period of time. So their influence waned. Now this is a picture of Stroud House. This is not the original Stroud house. On the property, there was a simple house that was built in 1827. When the AA company moved their headquarters to Stroud, they had to have something more majestic. And so they extensively renovated the cottage. And a point of note about it was that convicts built the home and they were housed in cellars that were underneath the house. So that has evolved over time. So five years it took to um, build and that opened in 1832. Now, two miles from Stroud was Tullagheri where the superintendent of stock lived. Now he became general superintendent for the company replacing EC Merriweather. The original homestead was built in 1860, replaced by a timber cottage, and today Tillagheri Estate is a working farm. Um, a number of these are AA properties you can stay at. So Tillagheri Creek is one of them. Um, and also Stroud House. Um, sorry, I think from memory you, you used to be able to stay there. I'm not sure whether you still can. And other towns that were important at the time, so Buru uh, was once the company's most important and successful crop growing area. And Buru House was built in 1831, once again by convicts. Alderley is located halfway between Buru and Stroud. And that name was selected as a, was an estate in England owned by his wife's parents, Sir Edward Parry. And Washpool, I find this fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, it's located on the Karua River and is named after the practice of washing sheep in the river to try to improve the quality of wool. <coughs> so by 1832, they had devised an apparatus where sheep were driven through a series of open pens sending them from one side of the river to the other. So that is washing them. And of course, 
they were better off as regards the price of their wool if it was um, free of dirt. So wash pool, when you hear it, I heard it once on the news last year, I think they had a hell of a lot of rain. But um, to me, that's a faint sort of name and that's why it's like that. Now this is Rural House. So um, this is the painting on the left. And on right is a photo taken in 1975. So if you go up this area, obviously it was AA Company area and most of these things were um, built by the AA Company. And for those who go up to Gural, um, I actually put this in just for, for my sake because I was intrigued. As you go up to Gural, you see this place on the right with all these gables. All right. So that is called Gable House. It was built in the 1860s and he was a carpenter and he built Rural Church in 1874. So when you go along that road, you'll go over to the distance and that's Gable House. So not to do with AA Company, but I just thought someone else might have recognised that house and sort of seen it in the distance. All right. So basically we've got this map here. And the AA Company has started out here at Port Stevens. Now, sorry, you might not be able to read much of that, but basically the point is they started out here and then they've sort of moved inland and that up there is the Great Divining Range and then they've kept going up until the Tamworth area. So they've sort of gone from there sort of right up. So they're getting into real sort of wool sheep area that we know today. So obviously it was a more successful business for them. All right. So basically they're starting their move inland and they're obtaining replacement land parcels. So they didn't want all their 500,000 acres at Port Stephens. It wasn't of any use to them. So they started trade parcels. So they got um, 250,000 acres on the Liverpool Plains, 313,000 acres at um, Gunaganoo, that's along the bank of the Peel River, and they were more suitable for wool growth. So basically, their initial efforts weren't particularly successful, but they didn't give up. They tried something else, and that was to go inland. So, um, Basically, they set up at Warra, that's on the Liverpool Plains, but that wasn't particularly successful, so they're continuing their move. But they still had a number of sheep stations in the Port Stephens area. Um, now, Warra was developed for fattening cattle and breeding horses for the Indian Army. Um, but an ongoing problem for the company was the shortage of workers due to the end of transportation. The AA company had been set up when there were convicts. So they basically had a pool of free labour, but that didn't last. And so changes had to happen. All right, so this is Gunny Ganu today. This is another property uh, where you can now get accommodation. So it's been restored. And if you go on the website, you can see all the outhouses and other buildings, things like that. That's a very substantial property. Um, and as I say, if you want to stay there, it's quite luxurious accommodation. And that's up near Tamworth area. Now, the people who um, were directors of the AA company were obviously very intelligent men and they had a rethink. In 1852, gold was found on the banks of the Peel River, but the company was unable to work gold under their charter. So they decided, right, um, we'll form another company. So they formed the Peel River Land and Mineral Company to purchase and work the Peel Estate. That wasn't particularly successful. Um, 
the amount of gold in the Peel River wasn't as much as what they'd hoped, but anyhow, they gave it a go. And the gold mining experience was short lived, and the company decided to concentrate on sheep and cattle production. And it also started its expansions to Queensland, where it purchased a number of properties. And 1959, the AA Company acquired the Peel River Land and Mining Company. They had formed it um, to deal with the gold mining. They acquired it and then they delisted the company. So that was the end of their uh, gold mining venture. Now, the company controlled a vast amount of land around Tanworth and 110 kilometres of the Peel River. And that property remained largely intact for over 70 years. But there was a problem. The government felt that the development of Tanworth was being hampered by the absence of small to medium farms. So you had the sort of squatters, the large pastoral companies, they would come in, they would take the land, and so it was under their control. The government wanted um, small farms to be established, so they started resuming land. And they resumed 100,000 acres of AA land by compulsory purchase in 1909. So the AA company, um, at times they were being very, very lucky, but they were part of this movement of the compulsory purchase of land. And also the Closer Settlement Act was legislated by the government and um, further assumptions were done in 1909 when the government resumed around 88,000 acres in Tamworth and for the further land was resumed in 1938. Um, obviously, as with everything else, they had to contend with the depression and further assumptions occurred in 1952 as part of the soldier settlement scheme. So they sort of, you know, came full circle. They acquired this massive amount of property and then um, through government intervention, parts of it were resumed. And in 1985, the company sold the rest of the Gunniganoo property. Now, that's basically the sort of movement of the AA company from the start from Port Stevens up to the northwest. But of course, there's another story, and that is the fact that they were given a monopoly to mine coal in, New in Newcastle. So the government was using convicts to mine the coal, and some of the convicts would have been miners but obviously a lot of them wouldn't have been. So you've got these people who are mining coal who basically don't know what they're doing. Now, to me, coal mining is a specialised um, industry and even though the labour might be free, there might be other issues that are being caused by this um, unexperienced workforce. Now, the government wanted the coal industry in Newcastle to be a bit more efficient than what it was. So they decided they wanted to look for a company to take over the coal mining interests. So we're talking 1830, so there aren't a lot of companies um, in the area at that time. So, of course, the AA company was an obvious one for them to negotiate with um, to see if they would take on coal mining. So an agreement was negotiated and they were given the exclusive right to mine coal in the district for 31 years. As well as that, they received a land grant of 2,000 acres west of Perkins Street, and that included some harbour frontage. Now, that obviously was very valuable because it's all right if you've got a coal mine, but part of the issue is you've got to transport the coal to the harbour. So that was extremely important. So up until 1838, convicts were used to mine coal. However, the company was realising that there were issues involved 
with the way they extracted the coal. And so some miners came out from the UK and eventually they found it was more expensive to use convict rather than skilled labour. So at least they recognise that fact. Now this is a map of the AA Company's estate in Newcastle. So as I mentioned, they were given 2,000 acres. Now, where was that land? Basically, it was west of Perkins Street, right? It included part of the harbour frontage and it includes suburbs like Hooks Hill, The Junction, Hamilton, and, of course, they are suburbs that have very high land values today. So, I mean, what a boost that was to the AA company to be given such valuable land. So um, they were very important in sort of the development of those areas and they obviously had a number of coal mines in the area. Now, when they took over the mining of coal, they found the government pits were useless or next to useless. So a start was made immediately to sink a shaft on the hill between Brown and Derby Streets. That was known as A Pit. So if you go up to Church Street, has anyone ever seen the plaque that's in Church Street saying, all right, if you haven't seen it and you're interested, it's a fascinating piece of history. You just go along the lower part of Church Street, about two blocks up from McCormack Street, and there's a plaque noting that that was the site of the first AA company mine in Newcastle. And the other thing is, you can see um, how steep it was to get to the harbour, and um, you can see why that was an effective way of getting the coal down to the uh, harbour. So basically, they had this huge inclined plane, and basically all the coal just went down and um, they employed about 125 convicts initially on the site. And in 1831, the first coal was loaded onto the Sophia Jane bound for India. So um, that was the start of the AA company in Newcastle. And you've got to remember that they had a monopoly. So there's no one else who could mine coal in Newcastle, right? It had been the government and now the monopoly is being given over to the AA company. But the AA company had difficulty recruiting a local workforce. As you can imagine, the company's industrial relations policy had been formulated and convicts were used. So skilled miners were not prepared to work under the same sort of conditions. Um, also, the mines were the oldest in the city and, of course, they'd been worked over a number of years and so the coal seams were thinner and more difficult to work and, of course, the plant and machinery was older. So there are a number of issues that the AA company had to um, contend with. They also opened new mines, um, B pit in 1837 and then C pit and oh, I thought the next slide was a map. I'll come to that. So one of the ways to get the coal to the harbour was they built a bridge over Blaine Street at that time, which is later Hunter Street. That's so greater quantities of coal could be transported to the harbour. So whenever you see Blaine Street, that was named after an employee of the AA company and basically we know today as Hunter Street um, West. Now... We also had a railway line at this point in time. So you've got a problem with the bridge going across Hunter Street. And Andrews says that passengers travelling in carts passing along Hunter Street had to duck their heads in order to avoid making contact with the bridge and on the Great Northern Railway. Although it dipped under the bridge, trains could only pass when a small engine was substituted for the ordinary locomotive which had brought the train thus far. So, and if you're into railway engineering, which I'm afraid I'm not, 
But anyhow, I'll quote what he said. <coughs> used a funicular rail system using two counterbalance carriages attached to opposite ends of a haulage cable, which is looped over a pulley at the top end of the track. If you're interested in this, Andrews has done an amazing book. He's done three volumes on coal mining in Newcastle. It's just amazing the detail he's got. Now, this is a picture of the bridges. Now, this is the original bridge, right? Here we have the railway. So you can see how low it was. So that was a real problem. And just look at the construction. This is Hunter Street, so a dirt road. Um, of course, it's horse-drawn transport. So you've got the issue of the people trying to get underneath the bridge. So this is a dray. So you'd have to duck your head. And this is the opening ceremony in 1865 for the Iron Bridge. Council told the AA company they had to do something about this bridge. It was just a massive problem. So they replaced it. They imported this iron bridge. You can see it is substantially higher. And one of the people standing here, one of those three, I think, was E.C. Merriweather. So he was the superintendent at the time of the AA company, and that's sort of the start of his association with Newcastle. So that's a very historic photo. But can you imagine what a barrier that would have been to Hunter Street. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's just amazing. Fortunately, we've got that photo. Now, as I said, EC Merriweather was the general superintendent of the AA company. Now, he's regarded as being quite a good um, superintendent. He obviously was a very intelligent man and he was able to see some of the issues involved with the company. So he improved the company's fortunes by overcoming labour issues in the coal mines and undertaking improvements on the large stations. He was credited with having installed a sheep washing pool at Warra and fencing the sheep runs with wire fencing for lower labour costs. And he married Augusta Scott Mitchell. Now, she was the daughter of James Mitchell, who owned the Burwood estate. Right. Um, after the death of her parents, Augusta inherited the property. But under the inheritance laws at the moment, it meant that Merriweather inherited his wife's assets and the estate became known as the Merriweather estate. So basically, um, Mitchell had a lot of land. He, also, he had um, three kids. Another one of them is um, David Scott Mitchell, who got land at Rothbury, and he is the benefactor of the Mitchell Library in Sydney. And the third child was Margaret. Um, her parcel of land centred on um, oh, a wobber and also Stockley. So very... Um, financially well-off family, but unfortunately it meant that his wife just had to pass it all on to her husband and she inherited it. All right, so this is basically the AA company line in Newcastle. So this is where, so we're talking about the Iron Bridge, which was the second bridge in that photo. This is where it's crossing Hutter Street. So this is just the bridge from a different aspect. So this is Hunter Street West, and this is sort of in the area of Crown Street. And, of course, we've got Church Street in the background. So look what a massive sort of barrier that is to Hunter Street, but that's how they got the coal across the street um, to enable it to go to the harbour. And this is what it was like at the other end. So... Um, number of ships waiting. That was um, a common occurrence um, in the harbour. Even at this point in time, we were one of the biggest coal loading exporters in the world. So you often had ships just having to wait for a berth. 
and um, the coal trades would just come down here and they'd be able to dump it into the ships. All right. Now, once again, this is from Andrew's books and this is the stage layout. So the stake was basically what got the coal from the mine to the harbour. And you can see that's sort of, that's Crown Street, that's Hunter Street, so where most of it's going across. But another one is also coming in along Burwood Street um, through Civic Park. And up there is the AA Company office. Um, and that is called Argyle House. And of course, fortunately, um, that still stands today. So this is a picture of, um, all right, Layman Street. That's Auckland Street going up there. And this is the line coming through. And most of you probably would have notice this little house that sort of you look down below and that house still stands there. Obviously St Stephen's Church over here. Baptist Tabernacle there. Yes, it's St Andrews. So, oh, I said St Stephen's, sorry, St Andrews, yep. And the manse, the manse isn't there today. So um, that just gives you a different sort of perspective as what it was like in um, the late 1800s. And of course, the only um, the only remaining remnants of the AA company is this. You all familiar with that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. So what that is? That is. Um, the remnant parapet of once was once a road bridge over a former railway line which passed underneath Layman Street. Right? And that little house that I pointed out. Um, now, I don't know why they've used this sort of words. This is from Tracing Tracks Through Newcastle. They say, it is believed to be the crossing keeper's house from when the railway to the Burwood estate crossed a railway belonging to the AA company, which connected its coal mines, known as the Borehole and Hamilton Pits, just west of town to the company's coal stace on the riverbank. But I don't understand, it is believed to be. Why don't they just say yes. the crossing keeper's house? I just don't understand that, as if it would be anything else. But anyhow, yeah. The um, Burwood Estate, when they found coal on the Burwood Estate, they couldn't get their coal to Newcastle yeah. because the AA company blocked it and they had to yeah. have an Act of Parliament yes. to put a line through from the junction yeah. where five railway lines from the mines met yeah. and went through the AA company land. But they yeah. had to get an Act of Parliament for that to happen. Yeah. That was because the AA company still had the monopoly and at that stage yeah. people like Mitchell and the Brown brothers were challenging that monopoly. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So whenever you go to, say, the local studies library or something, have a look. It still stands. And I had to stop for the train um, coming along that coal, coal line when I went to school mm -hmm. at, at Merrivilla. Mm -hmm. Did you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh. it was still in operation since the 1950s. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, these sort of bits and pieces of our history still exist, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of people just don't know the history of them. All right. Now, we have this situation of there being a number of entrepreneurs who are just watching all this from the sidelines. Now... The demand for coal was quite strong. So who's making all the money? It's the AA company. So there are other people who wanted to get in on the action. Chief amongst them was James and Alexander Brown. So they started mining coal at Four Mile Creek near East Maitland, which they were breaking the law. So legal action was taken 
and they were forced to cease operations. Now, Mitchell also got involved because he knew there was coal under his land. You could see it at Meriwether. You could see it if you went along the coast. You could see the band of coal along the cliffs. So he was sort of pushing the government as well. So basically there was a coal inquiry and that decided that the monopoly arrangement with the AA company should cease. All right, but as compensation... They received the freehold title to its land holding in Newcastle. Very nice. Yes. So, end of the AA company monopoly. And then they started to develop their mines. So, they basically, because most of the activity had been in a Newcastle, they started to move out. So they started to mine um, at Hamilton, at Cameron's Hill. Now, this borehole scene was a layer of good quality coal which was under much of the Newcastle area. So you've even got other mines like Waratah and Lampton and New Lampton mining this same coal band. Um, so basically the mine at Hamilton was um, opposite the church in Denison Street, that was where the shaft was, and the E-pit, which was the ventilation shaft, that's between Everton and Umaric Streets. And basically they continued mining there until it was mined out, which was normal, and then much of the land at Cameron's Hill was then subdivided <coughs> and sold. So Cameron's <coughs> Hill is basically um, Denison Street, the high part of Denison Street. Now, this is a picture of the map. So, D. Barstow, this is from the Living Histories website. So, you've got the mine starting out in inner city Newcastle, and then you've gradually got them moving out. So, the A pit was in Church Street, and then you've got the... Um, C pit here, and gosh, that's hard to read when it's magnified that much. And um, the B pit is sort of Nesca Parade. The C pit is in Bingle Street, which is up near the terrace. And the F and C pit mines were in Brook Street. All right. Now, there's no mention there of D and E because they're the ones that are at Hamilton. So um, that basically is where the AA company had their mines in the inner city. Now, the AA company made important contributions to the development of Hamilton. It contributed to the school building fund, made donations to various Christian churches and the Mechanics Institute, donated land for public recreation and sporting grounds, and supported social functions and clubs. And an interesting thing about Hamilton is when the pit was at its height, between 1871 and 1880, all of the miners living in Hamilton worked at one of the AA company pits. So it was established as a mining town. But from 1890 to 1900, only about a quarter of them worked from, for the AA company. So it's gone from a completely sort of um, working miners area and it's changed. Now, this is St Peter's Anglican Church. This is in Denison Street. And opposite this um, church is where the shaft was for the AA Company pit. Now, a wooden church was built in 1868 and then 20 years later it was replaced with a brick structure. And, of course, the um, school is on the right-hand side of that structure, which still stands today. And, obviously, the turrets are sort of an interesting feature to it. You recognise the Mechanics Institute? Um, that's the corner of Milton and Tudor Streets. And, fortunately, um, an enterprising brother and sister took that on a few years ago and renovated it and um, it looks gorgeous compared to what it was for a long period of time. 
Now, another interesting place is at 195 Denison Street. This was built for the manager of the pit. And um, that was James Lindsay. And then we had Robert Wyatt, James Baron Winship. And the house was then used for the company engineer. <coughs> now, um, his family had it for a long period of time. They owned it for over 80 years. Now, for the last 30 years, it was vacant and it really fell into disrepair. But Newcastle Council purchased it. This is what I'm talking about. So 195 Denison Street. It still stands. Built in 1849. So Denison Street is up there, basically. And if you go to 195 Denison Street, there's just this small strip of green space which allows access to the house at the back. It's thought it's probably um, one of the oldest pottery buildings in Australia. And it's, I think it's almost definite that it's the oldest pottery building in Newcastle. It's still standing. So it wasn't that size when it was built. Um, it's almost doubled in size. But it's nice to see now. It's owned by council. Um, sorry, I shouldn't say that. It was owned by council. Then it was extensively restored. It's used as a residence today, but I don't know if it's owned by council or whether it's leased by council. So, but it still stands. So it's interesting if you're in that area, just go and have a look at it. Obviously, that's private property, but you just see it from the road. Now, this is the AA Company office. That's our gold place. So we near the harbour. And basically, just look at the state of the road. We're talking a time of dirt roads, unformed roads. And this is what it is today. So um, that was Fanny's nightclub. So that was built in 1860. There's the AA Company headquarters, and um, they've had a number of additions over the years. And it's the only other AA Company building still standing in Newcastle. So you've got the house in Denison Street and that one. Is there another one, Jude? Uh, in Crown Street, or near Crown Street, I thought there were buildings with AA Company buildings. Warren House. Warren House, yeah. yeah. Warren House. Mm -hmm. They're using a company building. That's like the Warra House. I'll have to research yeah, that. I have it. Um, yeah. Warra House. Yeah. Up near Crown Street. Yeah. That's where the bridge went across. Yeah. All right. I haven't come across it in the research, but I'll, yep, certainly have a look, look at it. All right. Now, just going off on a bit of a tangent. The gold rush has led to increased demand for goods and services, and so they basically wanted a pay increase. Now, the life of a miner was very, very hard. In the 1800s, they had a lousy existence. Um, you know, the people who owned the coal companies basically, you know, it was screw the worker sort of mentality, so they really had to battle for, you know, everything they got. So it got to a stage where the miners wanted better paying conditions. So the AA Company miners at Hamilton formed their own society and negotiated with the AA Company to improve conditions. And the movement extended. In 1865, miners' lodges met to establish the first miners' union and James Fletcher was president. And um, he worked tirelessly to improve working conditions for miners. And he is commemorated in this statue. Um, that was erected in 1897. And it depicts Fletcher addressing a miners meeting. And it's the only statue of a local citizen to be erected in Newcastle. Oh, well. 
We're talking the 1800s. Yeah. Yep. Um, and of course, um, the mental health facility is named in his honour because he worked for minors' rights and, um, you know, improved conditions, their mental health. Now, the last colliery to be developed by the AA company in Newcastle was Sea Pit. It started production early in 1888 and was located near Derby Street. It closed in 1916 as the seam had been mined out. And that brought to an end 87 years of coal mining in Newcastle by the AA company. All right, and then the AA company has sort of gone off to um, the outskirts, Newcastle to Western, and so it moved out of um, the Newcastle area. Now, I find this photo just amazing. So this is basically sea pit homes in the 1890s. So this photo was taken from the obelisk and the land sort of in the centre is where um, in the end. So here you've got a row of miners' cottages and these would have been the colliery managers' cottages. So we're talking sort of um, Derby Street in the background. So that's what Inner Newcastle was like in the late 1800s. And this is a picture of the pit that was at the corner, near the corner of Derby and Parry Streets in Newcastle. So, all right. So the AA company no longer mines coal in Newcastle. So it's gone out to um, heaven. And the company was also changing direction. It decided it was going to concentrate on agricultural production. So they still had the loading stages in Newcastle. Remember, they've still got the patch of waterfront land. Still got their 2,000 acres. And basically the Iron Bridge was demolished and by 1923, we no longer had that um, bridge over Hunter Street. So they've got 2,000 acres. So this was the era of land sales. So they owned all land west of Crown Street. And as I mentioned, this would become Cooks Hill, Hamilton, The Junction and Islington. And they also expanded their purchase. They bought up 2,000 acres at Mayfield. And as the coal was worked out, the land was gradually subdivided. So they actually started to subdivide some of their unused land in 1852. They did um, allow some land to be purchased by miners at Hamilton. And the main thoroughfare there was Denison Street, and that was the main road this time that went into Newcastle. And many of the early streets off Denison Street were given the names of the land purchases. So Milton, Williams, Tudor, Chaucer, Murray, etc. Most of these people were or had been miners. And this shows you Denison Street. So this is where the church is. So the Bennett Hotel would be across the road. Um, so that looks fairly affluent for a coal mining community. You know, you've got a number of two-storey buildings. You've got wide streets. <coughs> and that's what um, Denison Street looked like over 120 years ago. Now, as regards... In a city land. 1853, they started to sell land on two major roads the road to Lake Macquarie, now Derby Street, and the road to Maitland near Cottage Bridge. The land was quickly sold, and many of these streets were named after officials or directors of the company. And you'd recognise Derby, Dawson, Lehman, Brown, Ravenshaw, Bruce, Paulette, and Governors of the AA company were Parry and Jumari. 
and they continued to sell land until the 1960s. Now, that is a map of what was known as Garden Suburb. So basically they planned this subdivision. This was the subdivision um, in 1913 and it centred on Bar Beach, Hamilton South. And there was a serious attempt to sort of promote this as attractive housing. So blocks were a certain size. Um, and if you look at a lot of the real estate brochures at the time for the subdivision, it promotes this as very attractive housing. And of course, that area today, um, quite expensive real estate. All right. So the AA company was asked by Hamilton Council to dedicate part of its land for use as a public reserve. At this stage, the company owned 40% of Hamilton Municipality. The company superintendent, F.L. Learmont, refused to give up the requested part as it was considered too valuable, and he offered another portion. Now, a lot of the parks in Newcastle basically were donated by people because the land was swampy and it would be... You know, it wasn't out of the goodness of their heart that they were going to donate parkland. It was swampy, would have been too expensive to develop. And um, so council accepted this swap. And, of course, we've got Lingmont Park, which is still used today. And the reason it got that name was the superintendent of the time. And the company also donated another part of swampland, 70 acres, for what's known now as National Park. So, you know, you don't read a lot about um, the AA company being um, particularly generous. I mean, I have mentioned them in Hamilton. They did sort of, you know, contribute to the School and Mechanics Institute, but you couldn't say overall they were, you know, very benevolent. You know, unlike, say, Thomas Crowders, who definitely was, you know, but AA company, no. Um, so once again, um, they've got into this issue because of a tax. So they had to sell some land to pay for taxes under the 1910 Federal Land Tax Act. Um, a section of land became the race course. Um, the company released a brochure which described the proposed development, broad tree-lined streets, high-quality housing for 5,000 people, and a recreation area, and the houses initially cost between five hundred pound and a thousand. Red brick bungalows with tiled roofs, and this is one of the real estate brochures. You know, so they're promoting this sort of Australian dream. Um, that was the type of um, development it was going to be. So this is Lawson Street, Turnbull Street. That one is Martin Street on the top, but now today that's known as Gin and Parade. So you see the lots are a decent size and um, that was part of the AA company estate. Now, hopefully if you've been to Leemont's Park, you would have noticed these pillars. All right. So they have Australian Agricultural Company, Garden Suburb, etched on these pillars. These are on Gordon Avenue, and fortunately they still stand today. All right, today. Um, during World War I, there was a shortage of wool, sh wool shearers, and the company moved from sheep to beef production. Southern estates were sold, and properties purchased in Queensland and the Northern Territory. So they're out of New South Wales. Um, they've introduced standard detritus cattle and Brahm cattle, and they've moved to Wagyu beef. And according to the company's website, more than a million people consume their product each day. So they've gone out of the wool and wheat, and this is what they do today. So um, 
It is the oldest continually operating company in Australia and celebrated its bicentenary next year. It is Australia's largest cattle and beef producer. It owns properties that cover 6.4 million hectares in Queensland and the Northern Territory. That's roughly 1% of Australia's land mass. And the company specialises just in grain fed beef and Wagyu beef production. So they're still going, still strong, have 1% of our land mass. So obviously very, very successful financially. So I'd just like to acknowledge that's my bibliography and also the photos courtesy of Newcastle Region Library and the University of Newcastle Norm Barney Collection. But if you're interested in this sort of thing, um, Brian Andrews' books, if you're not familiar with them and you're into coal mines in Newcastle, they're just oh, absolutely magnificent, the amount of work that's gone through them. And if you're interested in um, the coal lines and the trains, Tracing tracks through Newcastle is um, extremely interesting. It goes through and shows you where the tracks went and what the remaining parts are of um, those structures today. And thank you, Julie. We are always terribly grateful for the wonderful job you do when you uh, come and speak to us. Um, this, this has been a little bit of a different one this time because uh, the last year that you've done for us has been the early days yeah. of a variety of different um, suburbs mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. which are extremely interesting as well, yeah. um, but particularly with this one coming up to the 200 year mm -hmm. anniversary, um, it's very relevant to us at the moment in such a huge part of our history. So thank you again, Julie. You're welcome.